Hello, Eyewitness Week comes from Bedford, and from this view here, Bedford still seems to be very much the traditional county town it was 40 years ago. But away from the river, the face of Bedford has changed radically. Over 70 different racial groups have now settled in Bedford. And if you take its Christian community alone, the town can offer 50 different choices of worship. The Italians used to be the largest immigrant group, but in recent years, they've been overtaken by the Asians. Today, modern Bedford includes people from four continents, and within two generations, this previously traditional town has been transformed into one of the most ethnically diverse communities in the country. Just look at the range of ethnic communities you can find in a single street. Now, back there, the Polish club, and almost next door is the Islamic religious center. Around the corner is the Italian club, just up the road is an Italian church. But we're beginning on this side of the road with the West Indians. This Pentecostal community has brought to Bedford their Caribbean tradition of gospel singing. So we start with the choir of the Miracle Church and their chorus, Born Again. Building a community begins here in the nursery unit. In this group alone, there are Bengalis, Africans, Hong Kong Chinese, Indians, and West Indians. Now, why is it that given the size of its immigrant community, Bedford, unlike so many other towns, has avoided some of the dreadful examples of riot and racial strife? In seeking for the answer, perhaps it's no coincidence that Bedford's greatest son, John Bunyan, was himself a martyr to tolerance. And this, this is the Moot Hall where uh, he grew up as a boy and yeah. this is the... the Bunyan was green, born on the outskirts green, of Bedford, quite near here at Elstow. Yeah. So on this village green, he played as a child. And in the old Moot Hall, now a Bunyan museum, I spoke to Dr. Bob Owens to find out more about him. I'll go through first, Bob. I think I'm just about to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely old place, isn't it? It is indeed. Now, what kind of man was John Bunyan? Well, Bunyan was a son of uh, poor parents. His father was a working man, a brazier, who went about mending pots and pans. Like a tinker, and, didn't Yes, it? a tinker. That was what they called in the 17th yeah. century. And as a boy, he would have played on the green outside here, and he rang the church bells. And when he was 16, uh, the Civil War had begun in England, and Bunyan uh, left home and went and joined the Parliamentary Army. And he was stationed at Newport Pagnell uh, for two and a half years. And this was a very exciting time to be young in England because the parliamentary army, people were discussing very radical uh, thoughts such as, for example, extending the franchise. And people were beginning to think of how the, you could worship outside the uh, state church. And after coming out of the army, Bunyan came back here to Elstow and became a, a brazier like his father and went about the country uh, mending pots and pans. And he got married and he became a preacher himself. He joined the church in Bedford and he uh, began to preach traveling, traveling around the countryside and also in Bedford. But in 1660, the king came back again and Bunyan was uh, taken at a meeting 
and arrested and put into prison. Well, what were the principles he was arrested for? What well, was he fighting for? Well, the main principle was the idea of toleration, the idea that you could preach and worship freely outside the structure of the established Anglican Church. In the 17th century, people thought that you couldn't possibly allow ordinary people to meet outside the church because the whole social framework, the whole social fra fabric would break down. Thanks very much, Bob. That's the finest history lesson I've ever had in two minutes. We'll be talking to Bob again later on. Now, it was while Bunyan was behind this very prison door that he wrote one of the finest works in English literature, Pilgrim's Progress. And the wonderful opening of that work will be read for us now by the minister of the Bunyan meeting, the Reverend Peter Prothero. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and I laid me down in that place to sleep, and as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags, standing in a certain place, with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. John Bunyan not only wrote some of the finest words in the English language, his work has also inspired generation after generation of memorable illustrations. Wonderful illustrations. Now, Bob, tell me, why is it something written in the 17th century still appeals now in the 20th century? Well, I think, first of all, Harry, because Bunyan was such a naturally gifted writer of English prose, and also he had such a great gift for creating characters that come vividly alive. I mean, characters that everybody knows, like the, the foul fiend Apollyon, giant despair and doubting castle and the trial of the pilgrims at Vanity Fair. These, these are parts of the book that have just entered into the English language. But not only the English language, it, it's, it's popular in 165 countries, I believe. It's been translated in those languages anyway. Hasn't yes, it? it has indeed. And I think the reason for that really is that if you look at the core of the book, it's a very simple story. It's a story of a man who's on a quest for the truth. He leaves his house, he leaves his family, and he sets off, and he has all sorts of adventures and, and struggles and trials, and he has faithful friends, and he eventually makes it through over the river to the promised land. And I think that, uh, if you like, folktale element of the story is one that crosses cultural boundaries. And I think, again, that the story is one which is about the struggle of the poor and the oppressed and the dispossessed of this world who are struggling against oppression and against the rich and the powerful. And I think for those reasons, the book is one that appeals to readers of all nationalities. They can identify. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking to us, Bob. Very interesting indeed. Bunyan's influence on Bedford, now 300 years after his death, still lives. The Bunyan meeting fellowships, and it's my pleasure to sing with their choir Bunyan's own hymn, Who Would True Valour See?
300 years after that hymn was written, the 20th century came face to face with Bunyan's principles. When the Second World War ended, many refugees from Europe, victims of war and politics, found themselves marooned in Britain, and Bedford was prominent in offering them work. After 1945, displaced persons from all over Europe, Czechs, Ukrainians, Poles, and especially Italians, found employment here at the London Brick Company on the outskirts of Bedford. And then, 10 years after that first influx from Europe, a second wave of immigrants arrived, this time principally from Asia. And so today, the brickyards here at Stewartby seem like the United Nations. 32 different nationalities work here, and such is the variety of tongues that the London Brick Company has to issue its handbook to employees in four different languages, English, Italian, Punjabi and Urdu. Who could have imagined two generations ago that the Brickworks recruitment policy could have altered the racial mix of Bedford's entire community? The grandchildren of those first European refugees who 44 years ago came to the brickworks are still in Bedford. And in return for Bedford sanctuary, they've given the town a vigorous diversity of customs and culture. Few communities in Bedford are more proud of their traditions than the Poles. We went to the Dom Polski, the Polish house, to enjoy with them an evening of traditional dancing. Most of the Indians living in Bedford are Punjabi, and although they've moved thousands of miles from the Indian subcontinent, they've retained their Sikh religious traditions. The word Sikh, incidentally, means a student, and Sikhism, which goes back to the 16th century, puts great emphasis on the importance of learning. Although in most of their lives, men play the more dominant role, in Sikh services, women can officiate in the reading of the holy book. The grandparents of most of the congregation were small peasant farmers. Village life in the Punjab was very hard because their farms were too small to support them. And so, facing economic collapse, they were forced to emigrate. In coming to Britain, therefore, these Sikhs have had to adapt not just from the east to the west, but also from the countryside to the town. What happens when east meets west? Well, I've come here to Kempston on the outskirts of Bedford to talk to Mr. Judge and Dr. Pavinda to find out the answer. Hello, Mr. Judge. Hello. Nice to meet you. Pavinda. Hello, how do you nice do? Nice to see you, do. Welcome. Oh, nothing. Jaginda, when did you first come to England? We came here for a better opportunity. 
and to support the family. You know, the family is more important than anything else. Because everything learn from the family. So I think it is like a small world. Family is a very important. So you, if you have a nice family life, the children will be happy. So everything learn from the family. So family is very important. Do you still hold with the Punjabi tradition of arranged marriages? It all depends how we apply arranged marriage. You see, in arranged marriage, they have a good point of view and a bad point of view. But from my personal point of view, I will never force my children to marry against their will. So I am against in forcing. So I think if we use the Iranian marriage in the right way, it works all right. How do you feel about that, Pravinda? I think it's all right because our parents go into marriage with a more realistic sort of view of it and they'll consider whether families have a good reputation, whether you're going to be financially secure. And it's not just the question of, you know, being happily in love and the idea of romance and what have you. So I think it's good because practically it works better. I think in most relationships you have to work at it. It's not just a question of waking up one morning and finding the man of your dreams there, you know, <laughs> waiting to sort of sweep you off your feet. Yeah. I think it's good, but you have to compromise. Now, your family's had to compromise because they came from India to here. Now, you were born here. How do you feel about compromise, you and other young Asians? I think it's hard, but in the long run, it is worth listening to your parents and holding on to your culture and your religious views because I think it makes you into a much more richer, well-developed person. But how far... Are you prepared to compromise? Well, I, I personally have chosen to have an arranged marriage because I'm going to be happy. Because uh, I think in most marriages, it's better if you come from the same sort of background, same religion, same caste. But uh, I'm quite happy, really. And I think, we, I think Asians particularly are really keen on keeping the family together because that's where your source of strength and power comes from. Just follow us yeah. 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 I mean, in this country, you know, the idea of the nuclear family is and if so, it's sort of rapidly disintegrating, unfortunately, but we try to sort of hold on to it. That's the strength? I think so, yeah. I think, you know, friends come and go, you know. But I think when it comes, when the chip's down, you can rely on your family for, for money, for love and support. And that's what keeps you going, I think. Smash it. Thanks for talking to us and good luck with the marriage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, when East meets West, there have to be compromises. And nowhere have compromises been more happily arrived at than with music. The Bangra beat, which is a sort of hybrid rock, part Indian, part Western, has brought together Asians of all ages. So let's eavesdrop on the R group at the Sweetings Disco. <laughs>
तेरी चो हूं चक देने अंग नी को आके साडे को तो जामे संग नी का तो जामे संग Music can help build a community, but Kulti Bhupra, chairman of Bedford's Council for Racial Equality, recognises there are tougher questions to answer. He sees a task ahead as moving forward from the minimum goal of coexistence to something more positive. Kulti, are community relations here in Bedford as good as they appear to be? Well, on the face of it, uh, Harry, uh, the situation is in Bedford looks quite good. Um, we in Bedford over the last uh, 40 years have had something like m more than 70 different uh, communities that form the, uh, sort of, uh, the ethnic minorities in Bedford um, come and live in Bedford. And of course, uh, during that, those 40 years, uh, there has uh, been a fair amount of experience for Bedford mm. uh, to adjust itself to. And people on the whole in Bedford l live very happily together. And of course, there are quite a lot of good things that have come out of this. And one good thing, certainly, is that uh, whilst in other areas, in other towns, um, police um, tends to be rather contentious with, uh, with the local population, at least that is how it comes over, uh, we in Bedford um, find that uh, we have the largest percentage of the police force being recruited from the ethnic minority groups uh, as compared to anywhere in the, in, the, uh, in, in the country. For instance, London. Uh, uh, it is only 0.1, and in Bedford it's 2.3. That's very healthy, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Now, despite the positive signs, are there any sort of disturbing issues being swept under the carpet, perhaps? I, I think so. Um, for instance, in the employment area, um, there are certain um, locations, areas in Bedford that suffer from something like 10-12% um, uh, unemployment which is the basis for disadvantage and, and uh, actually generates a lot of problems. And there are other areas um, which we can perhaps call uh, wide middle class areas which uh, only have 2% or less than 2% unemployment. That in itself tells the story. So how do you see the future of Bedford? The, the future of Bedford, Harry, is going to depend on equality of opportunity to our future generations. Um, these youngsters uh, whose parents um, put up with a hell of a lot of difficulties in the early days and um, were in fact uh, uh, experiencing for, uh, such uh, problems that really without complaining about it they have come so far uh, but the youngsters are not going to do that and they're showing signs of that already um, these youngsters have a very much lower threshold of tolerance for um, discrimination, for um, treatment which isn't uh, quite right and, uh, and so on. So therefore it is uh, those youngsters who are looking now with a different perspective to their parents that we need to actually look upon and uh, meet the needs of and that is very important. Thank you very much Kuldip. Now as Kuldip has just said the future of racial equality lies with our children. The real test as to whether Bedford's built up a genuine community will be in the equality of opportunity the next generation finds. Our last hymn comes from the children of St. Thomas More School, and it was my pleasure to sing with their choir, All Creatures of Our God and King. Him, Alleluia, the rising morning. 
in praise rejoice. Ye lights of evening, find the voice. Oh, praise him. Oh, That's the end of our programme from Bedford. Next week, Highway goes to Brighton in Sussex, where we'll be meeting Dame Vila Lynn. I'm looking forward to that. I'll see you then. <laughs>